The Mecklenburg County election debates are a service of WTVI, Mecklenburg County, and the League of Women Voters of Charlotte Mecklenburg. The views and opinions expressed in these debates are those of the candidates and do not necessarily represent the views of WTVI, its management, Mecklenburg County, or the League of Women Voters. I'm Rob Bouvier with News 14 Carolina. In the next 30 minutes, we'll speak with three of the four Republican candidates running for Mecklenburg County Commission at large. All of the questions you will hear come from the League of Women Voters, and the candidates have not heard them in advance. You will have 60, second can 60 seconds candidates to answer each of the questions. You will have two 30-second challenges. If you wish to challenge another candidate's response, please hold up your yellow challenge cards. The candidates are Mr. Michael Hobbs, Mr. James Peterson, James F. Peterson, and Mr. Wayne Powers. Ms. Angelique Diaz-Landry declined our invitation to participate. Okay, let's dive, dive right into the questions. What makes you the best candidate for Mecklenburg County Commission? And we'll start with Mr. Hobbs. Uh, hi. Uh, I think uh, what makes me the best candidate uh, is uh, the fact that I'm a byproduct of my personal story. Uh, the fact that I uh, grew up in a broken home, uh, spent some time on government assistance, uh, and college was not an option for me. So what I hope to do is be able to be an example uh, to all the citizens of Mecklenburg County uh, that uh, you can achieve in America, you can achieve in uh, Mecklenburg County, and you can do that by uh, uh, being willing to, uh, to work hard, uh, to put forth the effort, and to strive for more. Thank you, sir. Let's go to uh, Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Yeah, what I, the reason I think that I would be a great candidate is because I've, my passion is actually as a uh, concerned citizen. I've, uh, I'm a native Charlottean. Uh, I've been in the public schools here. I've also been at the, uh, the local colleges. Uh, my strengths are actually in the financial services industry. And as, as, as we know, this, is, uh, this position is a budgeting position. Where actually, the county commission controls $1.3 billion. And as that function, the, 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 the biggest uh, strength I think that can bring to this is someone that is uh, fiscally responsible. And that is um, the direction that I uh, intend to take the county commission. Thank you, sir. Mr. Powers. Um, <clears throat> am I the best candidate? I don't know that I'm the best candidate or not. Uh, I hope I am. Uh, I'm running because I think I can make a difference. Uh, and that's the key. I think we have a, a county that's faced with uh, unprecedented problems. We're fracturing at the seams as a community. And we need someone to step forward uh, who is interested in public service and not self-service. And I am that person. So if I can pitch in and help and bring my expertise my commitment in this community for over 19 years, uh, then I plan to do so, and I would ask for your vote and your support, or at least your consideration. The additional funds that Charlotte Mecklenburg schools have requested from the county will primarily be used for teacher pay raises. County funds to CMS uh, have not historically been used for teacher raises. Would you support the increased funding to CMS, particularly for teacher raises? Why or why not? We'll go back to Mr. Powers. Look, um, CMS is broken. It is a broken uh, uh, model, business model. It's broken. It's failing our children. It's failing our community. It's failing our parents and our teachers. Um, the prior uh, county commission under Jennifer Roberts' chairmanship uh, cut some basic services dramatically to throw money at uh, CMS. And instead of fixing the, uh, the system, we're just throwing more money at it. It's broken. We need to address the structure of CMS. I'm all for teacher raises if we can afford them, but we're broke. So uh, until the bureaucrats in the offices start uh, dwindling in numbers, and until they stop getting raises and bonuses, uh, I don't think we can afford anything for our teachers, unfortunately. So I would propose one thing, that any raise that goes to anybody who is not in a classroom is matched by someone who is in the classroom. And maybe that'll stop uh, the money going to the offices instead of into the classrooms. Thank you, sir. And uh, Mr. Peterson? Yeah, I certainly agree with you, Wayne. That, that, I, I, I think that there's a, a lot of problems that are currently in, that we currently have with the uh, CMS uh, school system. I think the, the issue is we have a lot of uh, 
top-heavy administration out there. Um, the problem is we're not getting the funding, funding down to the actual teachers, uh, down to the students. When we have classroom sizes that exceed 40, 40 students, 48 students, we can't teach to that. No teacher can teach to that. Um, as it, I think our priorities need to be focused more on the teachers in that when, when we have teachers that are requesting, that have to send home requests to parents for, for pens and pencils and paper and, and hand sanitizer, something's wrong with the system. The, the increase of the $27 million this year, is, it's something that I, I certainly believe in, in the increase in teachers' pay. They're, they're very hardworking individuals. The problem is we need to start focusing um, on priorities in that area and not individually have, and not individually have um, the focus completely at the top. Mr. Hobb. Well, I think what you're hearing here is what uh, separates us from our, our democratic um, uh, competition. Uh, do not support continuing uh, to fund uh, CMS uh, as it currently is for a model that's not working. What I do support is uh, to refocus on vocational-based education. Uh, we have a lot of our kids that are not going to college, and we need to give them a marketable skill uh, so they can uh, come out of high school uh, have a job, contribute to the tax base, lower the unemployment rate, uh, reduce the amount of social services that, uh, that the uh, county is having to spend, and, uh, and keep uh, manufacturers and employers here uh, for uh, providing jobs uh, to, the, uh, to the county. Okay. The American Lung Association has ranked Charlotte 10th smoggiest city in the country for the last two years. Should this be addressed? If so, how? Mr. Peterson. The tenth smoggiest. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly believe in healthy, clean air. Uh, I would like to find out why, why they consider us to be the tenth smokiest. I know a lot of our industries are, are doing what they can. We have a lot of regulations on them now. Um, the, certainly the pollen is, is a huge contributor here in the South. Um, honestly, I, I, I would have to look at the regulations to see what what is contributing to that? Which what are the biggest companies contributing to that? Um, uh, as we are now, I think Charlotte is a uh, tremendous community to live in. We have a lot of opportunity, and one of the biggest things I think we need to do is to help try to encourage a small business as we go as we go forward. Mr. Powers, um, the tenth smoggiest in in what area, may I ask? In the country. In the country. <clears throat> All right, uh, I've, I spent 20 years living in Los Angeles, so if you want to see uh, air that you can see, uh, move to Los Angeles. Um, clean air is, uh, is, should be uh, a right of everybody who lives here. We, we have to be careful about how we address clean air issues. What we, uh, what we tend to do is we create regulation which starves industry, drives uh, business out of the area, and doesn't solve any of the problems. Uh, look at the example of, uh, we were told that light rail in Charlotte was going, to, uh, was going to address the clean air and the smog. Well, what you have is a, uh, a very poorly designed system where on South Boulevard, you've got within a quarter of a mile, you've got two stops where you have to cross the tracks twice. You can stop there for two, three lights at a time. People are belching fumes and uh, carcinogens into the air that you can see as we speak instead of just driving along. So light rail is actually causing some of the pollution. Okay. Mr. Hobbs. Well, uh, you know, I would put uh, uh, Mecklenburg County's air up against a lot of other uh, states and uh, a lot of other countries. And uh, uh, I think the focus should be on job creation. Uh, and uh, I would be really concerned about any uh, overbearing uh, government restrictions and regulations that would inhibit job growth. Uh, to me, job growth is job one. Uh, revaluation has been difficult, a difficult process uh, this year. Does the process <clears throat> need to be changed? If so, how? If not, why not? Uh, Mr. Hobbs. Well, the re reval process has been um, a, uh, a very difficult process and has created a lot of uh, anxiety uh, amongst the uh, uh, the citizens. Um, you know, I think part of the problem is uh, we uh, rely too much on uh, uh, computer-generated uh, data uh, and assessments. I think we have uh, 13 fewer assessors than we had uh, during the last uh, revaluation in 2003. 
Uh, I think that it's been a real mess, and uh, I would support an audit of the entire process and the organization uh, to find out what went wrong and how we can do it better next time. Mr. Peterson. Yes, I, I, I agree, Mr. Hobbs. I think that uh, our real, real estate uh, reevaluation process is currently broken. I think we completely rely too much on the automated system right now and not the actual experts on the ground. We, Charlotte, is, we have a, a huge community of real estate agents and appraisers, and, and we need to take in, we need to go to the experts in this area. They, they, they work in this field daily, they know the values of the homes. You can talk to any real estate agent and they can point to you each home as they drive by what the value of that is and what the property. Uh, evaluation should be. And, uh, and again, in a time when we actually have uh, a need for jobs and job growth, I think we need to in uh, introduce a system that actually utilizes our resources here in Charlotte. Mr. Powers. Uh, I agree with my colleagues, I have to tell you, on just everything that they've said. Uh, our revaluation <clears throat> program uh, this time around was a catastrophe, nothing short of a catastrophe. Uh, it was poorly designed, poorly executed, and the taxpayers and homeowners in our community are paying a very heavy price for our inability to do a basic job. Uh, revaluation needs to be done more often, more frequently, and uh, I would look at outsourcing the revaluation process to competent professionals and take it out of the assessor's uh, office's hands because uh, they obviously have shown that they can't do the job very well. Uh, the, uh, there are people literally being taxed out of their homes. It is further fracturing our community instead of bringing it together. Uh, and the appeals process has been inaccessible uh, and uh, almost impossible to navigate for many folks, especially senior citizens without uh, internet access. We need to fix it and we need to re uh, revisit the entire process from top to bottom. Are county property owners overtaxed why or why not, Mr. Peterson? Yes, they are. Uh, property taxes are, are, are uh, too high nowadays. We have many people that have been in their homes for, for years and years. And we get to the situation where a couple is sitting in their home. They've been there for 10, 15 years. They paid the price uh, back in, in early 90s. And now they can't afford to live there anymore. When we have a situation where that we're forcing people out of their homes because of ta property tax values, we, we certainly have an issue. Anytime that we're trying to raise taxes in a community, in an economy that's, uh, that's already down, we don't need to be doing that. There, there's a lot of people that are hurting just to keep their budgets there, pay for their gas, pay for the family food. But this is certainly not a time when we need to be raising taxes or property evaluations. Mr. Powers? Uh, we're the highest tax uh, city and county in uh, North Carolina. Our taxes are way too high. We forget that there are borders. We're right on, a, on the border. We're on the border with other counties like Iredell and Union County and Gaston County who have much more competitive tax rates. We also forget that we're on the border, uh, state border. We're on the border with South Carolina, butting right up against it. And as we see our tax base fleeing, both residential, our citizens are going across the county lines and across the state lines. They're fleeing the tax rate. That's why they're leaving. They're not leaving our beautiful community. They're leaving because the taxes and fees are too high. If you run a business, it make, we make it impossible to run a small independent business in this community. These things need to change because we are taking the things that feed our services, our tax base, and we're sending it over the lines. 10 years from now, if we're not careful, we're gonna wind up as Detroit. Mr. Hobbs. Well, I think the simple answer to that is uh, uh, ask the uh, thousands of people that have fled across uh, our, uh, our county line in the past, uh, you know, 10, 20 years. Uh, they will tell you that our taxes uh, are uh, too high and our schools are not uh, providing the education that uh, they expect uh, for their kids. Uh, so the answer is simple, and that is our taxes are too high. All of you said that taxes are too high. Um, and yet the county manager is stretched each and every year to come up with a budget. So I'm assuming that uh, you would cut some funding for some, uh, some departments. What would you cut specifically? Go back to you, Mr. Hobbs. Well, for me, uh, I think that uh, we can recover um, a lot of our revenue just by making uh, county government more efficient. Um, uh, I believe that uh, taxpayer money should be spent wisely, uh, that all agencies or groups that receive taxpayer money should be held accountable for properly managing that money, and I would support an independent audit of every agency or group that receives taxpayer money because if we can uh, 
tout our success on a national basis of uh, eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse, we can certainly do that in Mecklenburg County. Mr. Powers? Um, I'm glad you asked that question. And I would challenge uh, our opponents on the Democrat side to answer that question specifically. I will. Uh, what would you cut? First of all, when Chairman Jennifer Roberts uh, in, the, in the county commission, uh, they decided to cut parks and rec, veteran services, uh, and libraries by 40 percent, devastating those three agencies and the people that they serve. And they've thrown the money at the broken <coughs> system of CMS. That's not acceptable. Uh, I would cut, I, first of all, you have to take CMS out of the picture. This is a separate function, we need to address the whole structure of that separately. What's left, I would uh, exempt libraries, <coughs> veteran services, and, uh, uh, and uh, what was it, libraries, veteran services, uh, and, uh, parks, and parks, and parks and Rec, yeah, Parks and Rec. I'd exempt those three and cut five to six percent across the board. We could <coughs> save that with just eliminating waste and fraud. Mr. Peterson? Yeah, so when we look at the budget and things to cut and how to pay for, for various things, we need to first look at some of the, some of the uh, I guess, financial priorities that we have in the system. As we have mentioned, many colleagues have said, uh, CMS is an is a issue in itself. One of the things that we need to do is start going through and looking at these budgets on, a, on an annual basis, not just rubber stamp them, push them through. I mean, there's things in the budget. I've looked through the book. It's, it's over 500 pages. We have things in there where we're dedicating over a million dollars a year to, to refurbish cars uh, for every three to five years. And honestly, when we're, we're trying to pay over a million dollars for, for new county vehicles every three to five years, uh, I think there's some priorities that are, that are missing there. I mean, we, we really just need to go through there, uh, fine tooth comb, look at, the, look at where we can cut the spending. There's, there's plenty of areas. I mean, it, it's something that um, we honestly need to just bring some common sense back to budgeting. Uh, we, we all do budgeting in our family household and big <coughs> business, businesses. We just need to start bringing that back to the county. Each of you have mentioned uh, dissatisfaction to a degree with uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. Uh, and at the same time, test scores have been increasing over the last couple of years. Graduation rates have been increasing over the last couple of years. Uh, the school system has received the Broad Pies, which is a, a nationally renowned um, award for uh, excellence. Uh, what is it, if indeed they're <laughs> achieving success, what is it that you find uh, I'll talk to I'll go to you first, sir, Mr. Powers. What is it you find that's broken? What are you dissatisfied with? Uh, I'm dissatisfied uh, up and down the line. First of all, uh, the excellence awards are who are we could be compared to. We're being compared to urban school systems like Detroit. I keep mentioning Detroit. It's a model, and we're going that way, folks. Um, so so that we're excellent compared to Detroit should be no great uh, award to be quite honest with you. Uh, our children are being graduated. Uh, first of all, our, our graduation rate, we're proud of this. <clears throat> CMS is proud of this. Our graduation rate is 70%. 70%, one of the lowest in the state. Uh, that means that we have a 30% failure rate. A 30% failure rate. If, you, if uh, US Air told you that you had a 70% chance of a safe landing when you got on their plane, would you get on their airplane? I wouldn't. Uh, and would you send your child to CMS schools knowing that they have a 30% chance of not graduating? I think you'd have to question that. It's broken. We're wasting money, and the answer is not to throw more money at it. The answer is to fix the system. Mr. Peterson? Yes, yeah, so I think there, uh, what we're doing we're, we're in, in failing in the CMS system is that we're actually we're teaching towards tests. We're, we're teaching towards college preparatory classes, which, as Mr. Powers pointed out, none of our children are graduating. We have 30% that are left out there in Limberland. What we need to do is start introducing uh, um, more, more courses that actually get students ready for business outside of high school. There, there are plenty of students that don't go to college, and we need to account for those students as well through some vocational training, some, some, uh, some uh, internship, basically some education so that they are ready for business when they get out. We are, there's plenty of opportunity here. Um, our teachers are, are being evaluated on tests. They're not able to teach towards the children and what the children actually um, um, need as far as development. Uh, the problem is, again, we, the teachers do not have the resources to help in their classroom. <clears throat> Mr. Hobbs? Well, you know, if, 
if you uh, look at um, the Mecklenburg County budget, it's about $1.3 billion, and, uh, and we spend, uh, you know, close to half of it uh, for CMS schools. Uh, the question would be, uh, do the taxpayers of Mecklenburg County feel like that they were getting their return on their money? Uh, also, uh, as we've already talked about, if you look at the number of people that are fleeing across the uh, county lines, uh, in large part, to go to a better school system, and if you look at the, uh, the resurgence uh, and the rapid growth in charter schools, uh, there's been uh, recent articles about that and how charter schools are just uh, growing and growing and growing. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of people that will probably differ uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the opinion that uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools is being uh, good stewards of taxpayer money and uh, properly educating our kids. If elected, what are the first three changes that you would propose to improve, improve rather, the county's operations, uh, Mr. Powers? Uh, boy, the first three changes. Well, number one, I'd like to create a new environment uh, on county commission. Uh, I'm a Republican. Uh, in all likelihood, uh, unless people wake up and become enlightened, uh, we will be a, as Republicans, we will be a minority on uh, county commission uh, going forward. Look, we need to find common solutions, common ground with our Democrat friends and colleagues. Uh, we need to start healing our community. So my first priority is to have a conversation with people from both sides of the aisle. Have a conversation, as I'm doing during this campaign, <clears throat> with people in every neighborhood, whether they vote Democrat or Republican. You're seeing me at your neighborhood meetings. I'm there. I'm listening. I'm trying to find out what your problems are so we can address them. That's number one. Uh, you know, in a short time is, is a minute to, to tell three major changes to our governmental structure. Uh, might be asking too much. I hope we can uh, address this question uh, in the future and give you a more comprehensive answer. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Three changes, uh, just real quick. Uh, my, my, the three things I think we need to focus on are education, taxes, and then just big business regulations. Uh, we, we have this, this community, as, as has been mentioned, we, have, uh, we're, our, our, we're, we focus on the big business coming to town. We focus on the big companies that bring in maybe net new 100, 100 jobs. What we need to focus on is more the entrepreneurs of the area, the more the small business owners. We need to get the regulations out of the way. We need to make it easier for someone to come up, come out and start up a new uh, a website um, company or a new plumbing company or something that is, is grassroots. There's a lot of opportunity in this, in this uh, area. Charlotte is known for its, for its entrepreneurs, its, its uh, new, uh, new, um, new ideas. And instead of pushing those people across the county line, across, across the state line, we need to keep them here. Mr. Hobbs? Well, number one, I would um, uh, look at um, uh, uh, supporting an independent audit of every agency or group that receives taxpayer funds uh, in this county. Uh, number two, uh, I would uh, uh, look at uh, pro-job growth uh, uh, positions uh, that the county can implement to uh, encourage new uh, jobs to come into the county. And uh, number three, I would uh, look at the revaluation uh, process, uh, conduct the audit there to uh, find out what went wrong and what we can do better in the future. Governor Purdue and the General Assembly have been at odds over uh, funding for pre-K programs. Do you support funding for such programs? Why uh, or why not? Uh, we'll go back to you, Mr. Hobbs. Well, I think we all want to see our, uh, our young uh, children educated because uh, uh, that will mean, uh, I think, less uh, education expense down the road. I do have some concerns with uh, some of the pre-K uh, programs, and uh, one of my biggest concerns is the, uh, uh, the lack of oversight uh, that uh, I have read about and seen. Uh, some of the uh, information that they gather uh, from uh, some of the parents, um, uh, I just think that uh, that uh, process should be more transparent. Uh, they should uh, uh, take into account uh, more of the financial, the overall financial uh, situation uh, of the family uh, to make sure that those kids uh, that are getting pre-K are the ones that really, uh, really need it and, and, and uh, can't afford it, and the <coughs> ones that, uh, uh, that uh, can't afford it uh, are not taking up spots uh, that other kids uh, should have. Okay, Mr. Peterson. Yeah, I think pre-K is actually very important. It's many many families, uh, the people that can afford it, are sending their children to other pre-K 
um, education systems. And, and I, honestly, I, my children have gone through it, and I think it's a very beneficial opportunity to have the children in an education system before they get to kin kindergarten. Uh, it helps supplement their, their reading skills, their, their uh, counting, just the environment them, them, in themselves rather than uh, daycare, for instance. But um, I think we do need to have some transparency, and we need to make sure it's, it's done in a responsible way, something that it's actually going to be useful for the children so that uh, they can get the experience that, that our other children, uh, the ones, as I mentioned, that can afford it can go to these other schools these other systems. So I, I think it is something that is very valuable and that uh, we need to just make sure it's, it's done in a responsible way. Mr. Powers? I, I've, got, um, I've got mixed reviews on pre-K programs. Uh, all the research I've looked at suggests that uh, any uh, increases or benefits from pre-K pre programs for the students actually disappear by uh, first grade. So uh, they're not something that stays with a student long term. I'd like to do some more research on that, but uh, there's two things that, that you need to consider. What is the proper role of government? We've got a government of enumerated powers, and um, is it our role to have children in school and away from their homes from early in the day until late in supper? I mean, we feed them lunch, we're feeding them breakfast, pretty soon we're gonna be feeding them dinner. Now, I understand that there are people in our community that are in need. We need to address that concern. Whether it's the school system that needs to, be, to become sort of a nanny state for our children, uh, I question that. Uh, I, I want our children to be educated. I don't want our children to be drawn out of the community and, uh, and taught and raised by government. Okay, we'll now go to your 30-second closing statements, and we'll uh, stay with you, uh, Mr. Powers. Wow. Um, well, first of all, Rob, I want to thank you for moderating the event. I have moderated other events. I know how difficult it is to keep people like us in line. Uh, so thank you for that. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and WTVI for allowing this opportunity um, to uh, speak with you today. Um, I'm concerned about our community. Uh, it's www.electwaynepowers.com, www.electwaynepowers.com. Please go there. I want to have a conversation with you, uh, and I want to help to create solutions for our county uh, so that we have a future for Mecklenburg County. Thank Mr. you. Peterson. Yes, I also want to uh, thank you, uh, the opportunity for being here and the opportunity to speak to you. The, look, this, this election is not about Republicans or Democrats, or the no North side or south. It, it's, it's about common sense. We need to bring common sense back to the county commission. We need to bring responsibility back to our people. And we need to make sure that our leaders know that they're there to represent and serve the people, not the other way around. There's, there's, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff that's being, a lot of decisions being made right now. It's a very important election, and I do want to actually remind you to go to my, my website for more information, www.electjamespeterson.com. Thank Mr. you very Hobbs. much. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, WTVI and the uh, League of Women Voters for having us today, and uh, I would ask uh, the uh, citizens to vote for me uh, because uh, I do uh, have a unique story. Uh, I am a unique type of Republican, and uh, I think that that uh, uh, will help me be a, a good steward of taxpayer money as I uh, had to live uh, very frugally uh, growing up. And it will help me be a good example to people uh, that uh, you can achieve uh, if you're willing to put forth the effort, you can achieve and you can be a success. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Republican candidates from Mecklenburg County Commission at Large. Don't forget to vote on Tuesday, May 8th. For more information on the candidates and issues, go to wtvi.org slash debates.